and uh, i think just before we break for lunch we'll have dr karthik ananta subramanyam who's going to speak on interesting cases in nuclear cardiology the only thing standing between you and lunch is me so uh, uh, i'll try to get this done soon so the only thing we have not talked about so far is nuclear cardiology and spec and pet so i'll show you some interesting cases to kind of change the pace from didactics uh, i thank the organizers and thank for this makeshift so that we can at least share our work a little bit here so uh, uh, i do have some disclosures but nothing uh, major for this particular talk so we'll start off with a case of a man with dyspnea and abnormal ecg 61 year old african american male presents with worsening exertional dyspnea and non productive cough for 6 months followed by recent onset of palpitations and atypical chest pain past medical history has got some cardiovascular risk factors on presentation he had a uh, uh, stable vital signs a little tachypneic uh, elevated jugular venous pressure lung examination was clear heart showed an irregular heart rhythm uh, with no murmurs and uh, he had no edema here is his presenting ele electrocardiogram you can see that he has got um, sinus rhythm with a borderline first degree av block and an incomplete right bundle and multifocal pvcs during uh, monitoring in the hospital uh, he continued to have um, pvcs as well as non sustained ventricular tachycardia this is his baseline ecg a year prior which was completely normal chest x-ray which was done was interpreted as bilateral hilar uh, prominence as you can clearly see likely adenopathy here is his baseline transthoracic echo which is clearly abnormal shows generalized hypokinesia calculated ejection fraction was around 35% with some moderate increase in lv wall thickness and abnormal right ventricular function he obviously underwent a left heart catheterization given low ef and repeated recurrent non sustained bt edp was 20 and he had minimal non obstructive coronary artery disease so with the suspicion that he has non ischemic cardiomyopathy and non sustained bt obviously with an abnormal chest x ray a gadolinium enhanced cardiac mr was performed and you can see as as illustrated by the previous speaker there are clear signs of non ischemic pattern of gadolinium distribution you can see actually pretty significant mid myocardial delayed enhancement scattered in a non coronary distribution which is one of the key findings in a non ischemic cardiomyopathy pattern and you can also see significant septal mid myocardial delayed enhancement and more importantly extensive right ventricular delayed enhancement so obviously we interpreted this as a uh, as a significant abnormal delayed enhancement in the mid myocardium particularly right greater than left ventricles by ventricular hypokinesis with the mr ef of 29% on the left and 24% on the right um the provisional suspicion for ca cardiovascular or systemic sarcoid with cardiovascular involvement was obviously raised he actually was planned to uh, he was uh, scheduled to undergo a uh, icd placement but prior to that we decided to do a cardiovascular pet given that we did not have at that time technology to do a uh, uh, mr in um, uh, in icd scenarios which is now obviously capable so we actually sent, uh, did a rubidium uh, uh, ftg pet to uh, to evaluate for cardiac sarcoid and an important point i just want to make is that whenever we do pet imaging for sarcoidosis the key thing is to eliminate obstructive coronary artery disease prior to doing the pet scan because cardiac sarcoid patterns can be mimicked by my ischemic or hibernating myocardium so just uh, to go over for those who are not familiar you can see the uh, perfusion is on top and the fdg is at the bottom and obviously we do a uh, a uh, preparation which is unique for sarcoid which is essentially a uh, 48 hour prior to the scan of a very high fat diet followed by a prolonged fast prior to the scan uh, which is slightly different than than when you do it for uh, ischemic viable myocardium so you can clearly see that there is a perfusion defect in the septal area in the resting rubidium scan and uh, importantly in the uh, ftg scan you can see patchy uptake of ftg so normally because the heart is primarily in this scenario primed to take up only fat and not glucose any uptake of glucose in the heart is obviously abnormal in the correctly prepared patient so this clearly with a perfusion defect and patchy uptake raised the concern for cardiovascular sarcoidosis 
So the uh, images were interpreted as a, a patchy uptake involved in the septal, anterolateral, and inferior segments of the left ventricle with a calculated PET ejection fraction of 34%. So the diagnosis of sarcoid was established beyond doubt with two imaging modalities and showing active inflammatory cardiac involvement. So therapy was initiated with prednisone and methotrexate. A dual chamber ICD was placed and due to appropriate recurrent ICD shocks, amiodarone was added. After about six months of therapy with slow weaning of the steroids, the patient came back in for a repeat assessment of, uh, of disease activity. And this is one of the unique advantages of cardiovascular PET over MR, where PET can actually show the presence of inflamed myocardium as well as potential improvement with therapy, which is much more challenging with cardio MR, given that it primarily depends on T2-weighted imaging for edema as well as fibrosis, which are challenging to interpret for improvement of function. So here is uh, uh, the patient preparation with a, prolonged, uh, with a high fat diet and prolonged fat as we mentioned before, now you can see complete resolution of the septal perfusion defect which was present at baseline. And even though for, uh, for initial observation this may be a crappy image, this is exactly the image we are hoping for in a patient with healed cardiac sarcoidosis. So what you're essentially seeing is just blood pool uptake in the left and right ventricles and literally no myocardial uptake. And if you remember the previous image, there was primarily uh, focal myocardial uptake. So this, this essentially was interpreted as a significant and complete interval resolution of prior PET sarcoid perfusion defects with an improvement in left ventricular ejection fraction on therapy confirmed by echocardiography too. So the echo done after dual chamber placement and six months of therapy shows improved, not completely normal, but definitely improved uh, left ventricular as well as right ventricular function um, with some residual dilatation. The patient presented, unfortunately, after one year because he decided to stop the steroids as he was gaining weight. He presented uh, with, uh, initially after being in a good function state, it was repeated ICD shocks. So at that time, we had changed our PET protocol, and so we brought him back for a repeat PET assessment with a, high, with a sarcoid diet, about 10 hours of fasting, and we also uh, we do heparin infusion. Uh, which heparin essentially basically promotes um, lipolysis. So essentially, it even more pushes the heart towards fat, which essentially in some studies have been shown to be beneficial for rubidium imaging. So here is again now rubidium perfusion on top and FDG at the bottom showing extensive perfusion defects, which have recurred uh, uh, after initial resolution of that. You can, you can then also see patchy uptake of sarcoid, which is called a mismatch pattern, which can again be clearly seen here. So he clearly had recurrence of uh, cardiovascular sarcoidosis. The EF had also dropped to 35 to 40% with significant RB dilatation and hypokinesis and a more infiltrative appearance of the myocardium. So this patient obviously was considered for re, um, reinitiation of therapy. And uh, the case, which the reason I wanted to show it is you can see that the progressive improvement as well as recurrence can be very beautifully imaged with PET. So much to say that compared to the prior criteria, which is the Japanese Ministry of Health and Welfare criteria where PET was not included. You can see gadolinium enhanced CMR is in the minor criteria. However, PET is not. The, with the accumulating evidence of, invo of the role of PET in sarcoid, the uh, Heart Rhythm Society has published new guidelines re basically putting PET, uh, PET as a diagnostic modality for sarcoid. And now PET is really in the front line for diagnosing active cardiac sarcoidosis. Uh, and one of the algorithms kind of close to what we follow, obviously we do MR and PET in all patients who we suspect sarcoid, one, not only for fibrosis, but also for disease activity. Particularly when MR is questionable, we, we follow it with PET uh, to be able to actually delineate activity and initiate therapy. Uh, I will move on to the uh, next case. Uh, this is actually an interesting case uh, of a patient with heart transplant with multimodality imaging, which I'd like to share with you. This is a 79-year-old lady with a history of heart transplant 20 years prior who presented for routine annual evaluation of coronary artery disease. She, um, she was referred for a pharmacological stress pet. As you know, there is annual surveillance for coronary disease after the first few years with non-invasive imaging, either with dobutamine echo or with SPECT or PET. And we, um, in our institution, pharmacological PET has been used widely. She was asymptomatic and an appropriate medical 
medical therapy, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, and steroids, plus three antihypertensive agents. Her prior evaluations included spec scans, which have been interpreted as normal. This is her uh, resting electrocardiogram. You can see she essentially has uh, sinus rhythm with, uh, with significant uh, intraventricular conduction delay and a very abnormal uh, repolarization pattern with uh, very deep T-wave abnormalities. Here is her spec scan just for comparison from 2008, which I'm showing you, which was actually interpreted as normal. And um, going back and reviewing the scan, we, I would have probably interpreted it in a different way uh, from, from the original interpreter. So for those of you who read nuclear, you can see right away that there is a very asymmetric distribution of radioisotope uptake with intense uptake in the apex and an uh, asymmetric septal distribution, almost to suggest that there is focal asymmetric hypertrophy involving the left ventricle. Um, this is the spec scan from 2010. So you can see two years later, we have another spec scan, which actually shows interestingly that there is a minor perfusion defect in that same asymmetrically uh, isotope uptake ventricle in stress, which actually improves with rest. And this was actually interpreted as questionable LAD ischemia at that time. Uh, just again, if you focus on the resting images, you can clearly see that the isotope uptake is more focused at the apical zones. So finally, when she came in for a PET scan, you can see that she has a dramatic pattern of extensive perfusion defects. This is the stress portion of the PET scan. This is the rest. This is not a viability study. So this is a stress rest PET. You can see an extensive perfusion defect in the mid to distal LAD distribution, which on the resting images is completely normal with that same intense uptake. And here, the defect is much more worse compared to the 2010 SPECT image. Obviously, PET has a higher resolution, four to six millimeter spatial resolution compared to collimated spec, which has got a 10 to 13 millimeter resolution. So obviously, defects can be much more obviously seen with PET imaging. So obviously, numerous diagnostic possibilities, LAD ischemia, reconstruction artifacts at the apex, progressive hypertrophy related to immunosuppressants, or a combination of tacrolimus-related effects precipitating a hokum-like picture in this patient with microvascular dysfunction. So here is her echocardiogram. You can see non-contrast and contrast echo. Obviously, contrast echo is dramatically helpful in this case because you can not see the apex very well in the left ventricle, whereas with contrast, you can see mid-apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy-like picture. So the patient actually had a cardiac cath just a few months ago, which essentially showed that she had no severe, significant obstructive disease. So we know there is no actual obstructive coronary disease causing LAD ischemia. And so it was felt that this was not new significant CAD causing the problem. And the, diag the provisional diagnosis of multi-etiology multi hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in the heart transplant patient was raised. Interestingly, literature search reveals that there have been numerous cases of symmetric and asymmetric hokum diagnosed in the setting of tacrolimus cyclosporin and steroid combinations, which we believe is the cause of this patient's uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy-like picture. Just, for those of us who have transplant programs, following these patients with echoes and uh, imaging, uh, particularly if you see these abnormal patterns, should raise the concern of drug-induced toxicity-related um, uh, transplant, which we actually published a few years ago. Um, so I, in the interest of time, I've been given a warning. I will actually stop here. Uh, happy to re answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for this uh, excellent presentation. Very comprehensive evaluation of both the cases. Um, in terms of uh, the first case, uh, was there any hilar adenopathy? Yes. The chest uh, x-ray showed clear hilar adenopathy. Did those take up uh, FDG? Oh, in the, uh, in the whole body scan? Whole body Absolutely. Scan. Yeah. 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 And many times, uh, if a patient has no known or proven sarcoid, we do the whole body scan, and you may see a supraclavicular or mediastinal lymph Absolutely. node. You can do a mm -hmm. biopsy of that and, you know, not how to do an endocardial biopsy. Absolutely. And endocardial biopsy has any, anyway a very low sensitivity in sarcoid yes, because of the patchy distribution. Mark? And then the, um, then the, fi the sc they went away. And I'm thinking, does fibrosis or scars go away? And then it came back. 
And again, we think of delayed hyperenhancement as space occupying fibrosis or scar, but could those be the granulomas that were taken up the space and the steroids made the granulomas go away and they reappear? Absolutely, that's what we think too. And actually, if you look at the data, MRI fibrosis has also been shown to pre, uh, briefly resolve, but it's more challenging to actually interpret fibrosis resolution with MR, and that's why PET is more advantageous. Because we always think of fibrosis as a permanent scar in, in sarcoid. That's not the case. The literature suggests that MR can be used for follow-up too, showing resolution of small areas of fibrosis, which is basically granulomatous inflammation. It's granulomatous. Yeah. Fibrosis, I think of like strings that Correct. are just stuck there. Yeah. These are not, these, these are, are big, patchy areas. Big blobs of these granulomas. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, the good old statement is the test I don't know is the best test because I know the I don't know the problems with it. Even though the patient preparation is is good, in the sense uh, is easy one would think, but it's not that easy. Especially patients who are inpatients, some nurse would give him a five percent extras without our knowledge. So it it is a problem. Now there is a gallium dotatate has been used for uh, sarcoid two and uh, probably that has much less of a preparation. And now in India, I've heard that there are more gallium generators than anywhere else in the world, probably. I have one question for the audience. How often do you see sarcoid here in this uh, now? Because when I went to medical school here in 75, if you say sarcoid, you would fail in the exam. <laughs> it was tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. <laughs> But maybe, maybe it is not true. Maybe we were not, we are not detecting something. Correct. Yeah. Autopsy. I'm not sure. I, mean, I want your opinion. Autopsies show about 25% of cases of detected sarcoid, whereas clinically less than 5% are detected. It's like amyloid. If you don't think about it uh, and don't and don't look for it, you miss it. So what are? Uh, I think rather than pinpointing to the sarcoid, our major difficulty is with the granulomatous diseases as a whole. Unless until we are biopsying and in this biopsy we are just uh, means uh, giving them a diagnosis of granulomatous disease and further we are first line is tuberculosis and the next line then we can think of if it is not responding to sarcoidosis. So th these are a histopathological diagnosis definitely, but the response to steroid can be with both. But the dramatic response is definitely with a sarcoidosis. So that's the kind of error, but it is, hap it is almost similar. I don't think it is a different much. So the only thing, the biopsy, the way the Western people do, we, we are not doing to that extent. Mostly people are doing with the empirical. Then when it is not relieved, then only they are researching to the biopsy. Uh, and in few, most of the cases where there is sarcoid or tuberculosis of the myocardium, there is involvement of mediastinal and lymph nodes also in our scenario. They are, where they are doing EBUS or EUS guided biopsies and confirming it. And uh, in spite of it being coming as sarcoid, in many Indian scenarios, in uh, there is a largest series from Dr. Narasimhan of Care Hospital. They are they are using both uh, uh, treatment for sarcoid as well as tuberculosis, and they have found it, it as a good response. Maybe it holds. It doesn't hold good in rest of the world, but in developing countries like India, where the tuberculosis is rampant and uh, starting ATT and uh, the treatment for sarcoid both has shown good results and the patients are doing well. Thank you. Do we have a population of patients in the, that went in the World Trade Center and they're getting sarcoidosis wow. also? Right. We're seeing in the lungs the pony people, so there may be some environmental issues Absolutely. as well. It's not yeah. only that we weren't detecting it, more Absolutely. people getting it. Thank you. So we, we request the chairpersons to present uh, Dr. Karthik Anantha Subramaniam with the memento and certificate.